it's my it's my big pleasure to present Dylan Batson from the University of Oxford, and he will uh, give a lecture course on vertex algebra from divisors on Calabi-Yau threefold and perverse coherent systems. So, Dylan, please. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very uh, excited to be here, and thanks, Jan, for the uh, the invitation. I'm flattered that you guys are uh, interested to hear so much about this topic, and uh, yeah, it's something I've been thinking about for a while, so uh, excited to share. Uh, so the title is a bit of a mouthful, and let me just say, uh oh, that's not good. How do I go to the next thing? Okay, so let me just say a little bit about what the, the point of the lectures are. So the goal is to explain a correspondence between enumerative algebraic geometry and representation theory. So uh, to say a little bit about the ingredients, um, enumerative in ge geometry uh, is the study of some invariants of, in, in our, the situation we'll be interested in, algebraic surfaces and threefolds. Uh, and the relevant invariants uh, have the names Buffa Witten and Donaldson Thomas. And in, in general, uh, as I'll explain, the idea is that maybe you study certain spaces of coherent sheaves on these varieties, and that gives you some kind of invariance that allow you to understand something about their algebraic geometry. On the representation theory side, the kind of relevant characters will be some infinite dimensional algebras, which are related to affine Lie algebras. Um, so the one that I'll be emphasizing the most are the class of algebras uh, will be this one called vertex algebras that appeared in the title, but there will also be Hall algebras and Yangians that will make appearances throughout the lectures. Um, today we'll just have the first ones and I'll explain a bit about them. And then finally, the correspondence between these two things, the enumerative geometry and the representation theory, will be using some somewhat well-known tools in math that are kind of under this paradigm of geometric representation theory. So today the plan is to uh, give a little bit of background about each of these ingredients, the geometry, the representation theory, and the kind of correspondence using geometric representation theory, and uh, try to explain the simplest examples of the type of things we'll be interested in in the later lectures, uh, sort of for each of the ingredients. Uh, so just to give a bit of a preview so you can decide if you want to continue attending or not, um, the second lecture uh, will be about the enumerative geometry in grid. So <clears throat> together with Miroslav Rapchak, we developed a, a sort of construction of certain moduli spaces, which we call moduli spaces of perverse coherent extensions. And they will be the natural generalizations to uh, kind of more general surfaces in threefolds of the sort of basic uh, spaces of sheaves that I'll, I'll describe later today in the section about enumerative geometry. Uh, lecture three will be kind of standalone lecture. I'll give a more traditional seminar, uh, as I think Jan requested, um, which will just overview the entire correspondence. So necessarily, I'll explain a bit about all the ingredients, but maybe not in, in so much detail and try to explain the, the correspondence. And then lecture four, uh, I'll emphasize sort of future directions, connections with representation theory, and maybe discuss some kind of more exciting uh, aspects of the correspondence that probably require a more detailed understanding of representation theory than I will be able to explain in the, the third lecture. Okay, so that's the plan for uh, all the lectures. And so now I'm going to start just explaining some kind of very basic things about enumerative geometry and try to introduce the, the simplest examples for today. By the way, if at any point you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me. And oh, I've just realized I'm just going to grab my cell phone so I can keep track of the time. But remind me, am I stopping at uh, 20 or 30? Can you just tell me? No, uh, well, uh, you can. Uh kind of stop in between, between 20 and 30. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, we'll, we'll see. You see, that's the reason that for the, the graduate students might have the next class. As for me, I can stay for longer, but probably it's better to stop by 30. By... Yeah. Okay. Great. Strictly by 30. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, super. All right. So, yeah, as I was saying, please 
just unmute yourself and just speak out and interrupt. I mean, you can use the raise hand feature if you're kind of feeling shy, but I uh, just go for it. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna provide a brief introduction to enumerative geometry. I'm not exactly uh, an expert in the most you know, general aspects of algebraic geometry, so I'll be brief, but I just wanna give some kind of idea of the, the sorts of things we'll be interested in. So of course, uh, as I'm sure you all know, the kind of simplest algebraic invariants that one associates to a manifold or a variety are the uh, homology groups or their dimensions, the so-called Betty numbers of the space. And these are like a fairly coarse invariant. They kind of just depend on the underlying topological space, as you know. On the other hand, there's a kind of important idea that I, I think was used to great effect in the 20th century and going forward, like in modern mathematics, uh, in order to produce more refined invariants of a space X, which include some uh, aspects of geometric structures on X rather than just its topology, one sort of uh, very successful strategy has been to construct certain moduli spaces, M of X associated to the space X, which typically might be spaces of solutions to certain differential equations on X. And then you might use the geometric structure uh, on X, maybe a metric or the fact that it's an algebraic variety, something like that. Uh, you might use that in the definition of the differential equations. So then this moduli space will be encoding that extra geometric structure. And then you can still study these kind of simple linear invariants like homology groups, but you can study the homology groups of this moduli space instead of just the space X itself. And this provides kind of richer classes of invariants that encode more interesting data about the space. Um, and a very common uh, situation that occurs is the moduli spaces you're interested in will have some kind of natural decomposition into connected components, where the components, I mean, here I've just labeled them uh, by an N, but they're, you know, maybe labeled by some uh, discrete invariant of the underlying geometric data that the moduli space is parametrizing, maybe some churn classes, that sort of thing, if the moduli space is a space of sheaves. And then it's a very common and useful trick to build a kind of generating function out of these invariants. So you can kind of sum all of the possible connected components and all of the possible Betty numbers, sometimes taking literally the degree of the Betty number might not be the right thing. Maybe you need some kind of more subtle filtration on the cohomology, but that's not so important. In any event, you can kind of formally sum all of these numbers and add some, uh, some kind of polynomial dependence here and, and think about this whole polynomial as an invariant, this generating function. This is often a useful thing to do. And so then you think of this kind of function zx as some kind of invariant of x. Um, and when x is an algebraic variety, as I already alluded to, one natural kind of uh, source of moduli spaces are spaces of coherent sheaves on X, where maybe you ask for some kind of support conditions. You know, the whole space of coherent sheaves is potentially very large, but maybe you'll look at compactly supported sheaves or sheaves supported along some sub variety, maybe dimension one, dimension two, et cetera. Um, so those are the kind of moduli spaces we'll be interested in. And today I just want to explain the kind of one of the simplest families of such moduli spaces, which are spaces called Hilbert schemes. Are there any questions? Okay, great. So <clears throat> uh, let S be a smooth algebraic surface over C. And uh, for what I'm about to say, it's perfectly fine if you're not a great algebraic geometer to just think that S is C2. This will still be an interesting even in that kind of simplest example. And a lot of the things I'll say will actually be true of maybe some much more general varieties, not just surfaces. Maybe they don't need to be smooth, but I don't want to like spend time just in this introduction worrying about exactly when I'm using certain hypotheses. Um, anyway, so we take this, this smooth surface, so you can think C2 if you like, and we'll define the Hilbert scheme. It's denoted by Hilb sub n of s for n some positive integer. And it's a moduli space which parametrizes all of the zero dimensional subschemes of S. And uh, if you have a zero dimensional subscheme, 
maybe it looks like a collection of points, something like that. Um, one natural invariant is the dimension of the structure sheaf of that subscheme. And that's that's what the uh, the Hilbert scheme will kind of decompose into some components labeled by it. Um, so for example, uh, a typical subscheme with structure sheaf of dimension n is like n disjoint points. But you could also have some more interesting subschemes where you know you had some, for example, an nth order kind of infinitesimally thickened fuzzy point that that would also be a point in Hilb n. So concretely, Hilb one of s, for example, is just the space of all points in s. So it just looks like s as a variety. These things are, are always varieties. So there's kind of very general results going back to Hilbert, Gordon Deke, people like that. Um, and more generally in the surface case, uh, Hilb n of s will be a resolution of the symmetric product. So by this, I mean like the quotient by the symmetric group of the nth product of s. Um, so you can kind of think that it's it's something like the, the nth symmetric power Hilb n in the sense that it's like keeping track of and unordered points, but when the points collide, there's some kind of resolution that keeps track of the different directions in which they can collide. So these are some, some kind of fairly natural spaces. And it's kind of tautologically true that we can think of Hilb n rather than parametrizing subschemes as parametrizing the ideal sheaves of such subschemes, of these zero dimensional subschemes. So, and then, you know, n would then be the co-dimension of the ideal sheaf as opposed to the dimension of the structure sheaf. That's perfectly fine. Um, and from the perspective, <clears throat> pardon me, from the perspective that we would like to think of Hilb n as the simplest example of a moduli space of sheaves, it might be nice to answer the following simple question. Can we characterize which sheaves are actually ideal sheaves of such zero-dimensional subschemes? in some abstract way without sort of just explicitly saying that, like what exactly is the moduli space of coherent sheaves satisfying some conditions that we're studying here. And so we have our first proposition, which is fairly easy and I'll give a short sketch of the proof. So the statement is that this Hilbert scheme that I've described above is equivalent to the moduli space of pairs E comma phi, where E is what's called a torsion free sheaf on S, and it has some discrete invariants that will fix. Its rank will be one, and its second churn class will be n, where n is the same n as above. And phi will be an isomorphism from E double dual to the structure sheaf of S. So if you've never heard of a torsion-free sheaf, that's, um, that's fine. But the, it, it, I mean, so the definition will just be a sheaf that has no torsion subsheaves. So there's no, for example, sections that are supported on something of positive codimension. They're all, they all sort of look like sections of a vector bundle that are supported everywhere. So these things are almost like vector bundles. And they have a canonical map to their double dual, which I'll, I'll sort of write in a second. Um, and the double dual, uh, it, is kind of locally free up to co-dimension three. And as a result, when you're on a surface, or smooth surface, again, maybe I'm, it could be more general, but let me not worry about the exact details. Um, on a smooth surface, E double dual will always be a vector bundle. And the rank of that vector bundle will be called the, uh, the rank of E. And so when I ask for this, uh, this trivialization, it's not, you know, such a crazy constraint. It's just saying that this double dual, um, you know, can't be some more interesting uh, vector bundle of rank one, like some more interesting line bundle. Okay, so let me say a bit about the, the proof of this and maybe it'll help you get kind of an intuition for the state. So as I said, any torsion-free sheaf E has a natural map to its double dual. And this is kind of a tautological fact that E pairs against its dual. So it defines an element of the dual of the dual. Um, and this map is known to be an isomorphism in co-dimension one, and it's always injective. Uh, our isomorphism of E double dual with the structure sheaf of S, then this, in this inclusion, since we know it's injective, gives an inclusion of E into the structure sheaf. So we can think of E as some subsheaf of the structure sheaf. 
And the fact that this map is an isomorphism in codimension one means that the co-kernel of this inclusion, let's call it F, will necessarily have zero dimensional support. So E is kind of almost like a vector bundle, but it has some kind of co-kernel, which is you know, some coherent sheaf that's supported at some number of points. And now, of course, uh, since support of F is zero dimensional, we can identify it with the structure sheaf of some, uh, some zero dimensional subscheme as above. And it's not sort of an elementary exercise in the definitions to check that the, uh, the dimension of the structure sheaf here will match the second churn class of E. And thus E, get as the kernel of this map from OS to OZ, is identified with the ideal sheaf of Z. And as we said above, the Hilbert scheme is equivalent to the space of ideal sheaves of these zero dimensional subschemes, and that uh, completes the proof of the proposition. Are there any um, questions about that before I go on? This is something which I, I, I explained in my graduate course, so <laughs> at least graduate students should, should, should know that stuff. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, I didn't want to go too fast. It sort of wanted to be an introductory lecture, but that's great if people know this stuff. Also, if it's sort of boring, I can speed up. Also, let me know. Um, all right, so let's see. So now I want to explain, uh, this should be a math BBC. Um, I want to explain something about how to think very concretely about the Hilbert scheme. In the simplest case, that S is just B2, the, the affine plane. So for S equals C2, consider the following framed quiver with relations. So here I draw this quiver, it has sort of two nodes. The square indicates that the vector space there is canonically trivialized where the circle indicates that it just is some vector space, not necessarily phi to the n that, uh, that one needs to choose in specifying a quiver representation. And so the space of representations of the uh, unframed quiver. So when I say that here, when I write rep and Q, I mean just the quiver without the framing. So you can kind of ignore this part for now. I'll just messily scratch this out. Um, so to specify a quiver representation, we need to choose a vector space. So uh, in this case, uh, I, I've written rep n here to denote the kind of n-dimensional representation. So we need to choose an n-dimensional vector space. And then we need to prescribe two endomorphisms. Now, of course, we can choose an isomorphism of this underlying vector space V with C to the N, after which these two endomorphisms define elements just of GLN. But then we'll need to quotient by the choice that we made, namely the choice of trivialization or the, the choice of isomorphism of V with C to the N and the, the space of such choices is a, is a GLN torsor. So we quotient by this GLN, we form the quotient stack. And when I say this is a quiver with relations, i.e. we have this relation that B1 and B2 commute, um, that means that the space of representations is defined to be the set of commuting B1 and B2, again, uh, and we take the quotient stack with respect to GLN. Okay, so similarly, Similarly, the space of framed representation, so now this is just representations of the entire quiver, is B1 and B2 as before, V a vector space as before, which we can choose a trivialization of, again, at the cost of taking this uh, quotient stack. But now we need the additional information of this map I from C to V. And you know, after we make this choice of trivialization, this map I is just equivalent to a vector in C to the N. So the space of framed representations, in this case, is the space of pairs, B1, B2, and I, such that B1 and B2 commute as before. And this we can uh, consider as a, a sub stack of this uh, quotient stack of GLN times GLN times C to the N. Any questions so far? These are just some kind of standard definitions. If, if you didn't know what representations of a framed quiver with relations were, now you do. Um, and I'm going to consider a subspace 
uh, I say here substack, but really it's uh, it turns out to be a, a variety because this is kind of a good choice of stability condition. So we consider this sub variety defined by the condition that this vector in C to the N determined by I generates V under the endomorphisms B1 and B2. So I is kind of a cyclic vector for this module over B1 and B2. And now I claim this, I call it a theorem, you know, it's, it's not such a hard statement to check, but it's sort of, uh, you know, it's an instance of some kind of more famous results that maybe people call theorems like the ADHM construction, um, that this space is isomorphic to hill bend C2. So let's talk a bit just before I, I sort of state the rest of the details uh, of the statement, like how do you define this isomorphism? Let me just talk a bit about the heuristic. Uh, and, and I'll write something. Uh, so, so a kind of simpler statement, which is possible to make, is to consider just this full space of representations of the unframed quiver, no stability condition, the one that we had above here, rep n of q. And I claim that it's not hard to see that this space is identified with the moduli stack parametrizing compactly supported coherent sheaves on C2. The S here means compactly supported, co means coherent, coherent sheaves on C2. Okay, you see that my writing is not great, which is the reason that I elected to uh, use slides here. Um, How the right. eyes reflected in this modular space, the dimension on uh, but you said the modular space for coherent shifts with compact support. You, you should um, also fix the discrete parameters, which yeah, is... there should be some n involved on the right hand uh, side. Right, sorry, you're absolutely right. Where is where is hmm. n? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So let me draw an extra n here. Um, so where n? Thank you very much. N means that, uh, let's say, the dimension of their global sections, uh, let me write H0, of whatever coherent sheaf is N. OK, thank you. So indeed, <clears throat> to specify a coherent sheaf on C2, uh, you know, C2 is affine, so um, it, it suffices just to give a vector space, which is the space of global sections. And to give that vector space, the structure of a module over functions on C2, the adjoin x, y. Now, functions on C2 has two generators, x and y. And what you can think is that the vector space v underlying the quiver representation simply is the space of global sections. And the endomorphisms B1 and B2, which are required to commute, prescribe the actions of the two generators, X and Y. That's kind of the heuristic. So for example, if you imagine you had a representation that say uh, was one dimensional for simplicity. So let me draw a kind of funny example here. So we have C, I'll draw it with a circle around it. I don't know, I don't know what this means, but whatever. And then you imagine you have B1 and B2 you need to prescribe, right? So of course, these endomorphisms in C are just gonna be given by some numbers. They could be, for example, lambda one and lambda two. And this would correspond, it's called maps to the structure sheaf of just the point with coordinates lambda one, lambda two in C because you know, x acts on the structure sheaf of the point located there by the x coordinate, and similarly with y. And then you can imagine if you have some kind of more interesting, uh, well, for one, you could have a direct sum of, of modules like this, and that would be some direct sum of structure sheaves of points. And then if you wanted to have some kind of more interesting coherent sheaves that maybe look like some extensions, you could build some more interesting representations of this quarter. It's the kind of heuristic. Now, uh, 
what is the extra data of this cyclic vector? Of course, uh, a compactly supported coherent sheaf is not quite kind of canonically the structure sheaf of some subscheme because it doesn't have the map from uh, the trivial C adjoin XY module. Sorry, there's some background noise here. Um, it did spark at me. I got a little distracted. It doesn't have the, the required map from the structure sheaf. So that is precisely what's encoded in the data i. So uh, you can think of that i is somehow corresponding to the map c adjoin xy to this, you know, uh, let me call it f, this kind of compactly supported uh, coherent sheaf. And that's the kind of additional data required to, uh, to make the construction. So, so this was kind of heuristic, but now let me point out that there's a very slick way of kind of packaging together these intuitions that I was just explaining, maybe a little bit um, sloppily, into a, a kind of closed form expression for the actual ideal sheaf that corresponds to the given representation. And if I can erase my annotations here, that is given by the following formula. So if we have a representation given by a vector space of B, a representation of quiver, the two endomorphisms, B1 and B2. And uh, sorry, there's some background noise. Just give me one second. Sorry. Uh, or something going on, it's, it's fine. Um, so, pardon me. So we can write down this complex out of the data. So here I've written a complex of coherent sheaves on C2. Uh, where the, used... the last summand on the bottom is not visible, although people should know. Oh. I mean, it's another copy of this. Yeah, it's also possible if your Zoom is, if your like zoom bar is at the bottom, you can maybe move it to the top and it might become visible. Maybe uh, not, but that is okay. that is a possibility. In, anyway, it's in, but, in other sense. Okay. Okay. Right. So, sorry. Uh yeah, that might um be slightly annoying. okay. So well, I was actually about to just comment. Um, if we, for example, to begin, if we again ignore the contributions of of this uh, element i. So if we ignore this bottom sum and, which maybe I'm scratching it out here, but maybe you can't even see that. Um, and then we ignore the maps to and from it. Then what we can see, let me even further assume that all of the bi's were just the zero. It's kind of a radical assumption. Then what you see here is simply the causal resolution of the structure sheaf of a point tensored with the vector space V. So in the simplest case, when all the Bs are zero, we just find a direct sum of the structure sheaf of a point, sort of V many times. And then what turning on these matrices that map between these multiplicity spaces uh, V, what turning them on does, it kind of specifies, so. For example, again, as before, if you imagine that V was like one dimensional, then by turning on B1 or B2 to some specified numbers, that would be shifting from the causal resolution of the structure sheaf of the origin to the resolution of the structure sheaf of some other point determined by the numbers B1 and B2. And more generally, having some kind of more interesting Bs that aren't necessarily diagonalizable, but maybe have some kind of off diagonal terms, that would determine the causal resolution of some kind of extension of several copies of the structure sheaf of a point into the structure sheaf of some kind of fuzzy point. Uh, so Dylan, the, when you say H0, do you mean cohomology in the middle or in the left? So you didn't say- uh, Right, I didn't say the grading. And in this case, I mean in the middle, but here I'm using the convention that I'm the sheaf I'm trying to describe is the ideal sheaf. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, right. So the thing I wanted to emphasize is that, which will come up in the, the sort of second lecture, is that the way that we're kind of building up this moduli space of sheaves from the quiver representation is by taking kind of a bunch of Kudul resolutions of very, very simple sheaves, like in this case, the structure sheaf of a single point. And then we're using the data of the quiver representation, like the linear maps, to introduce some extra differentials, which we can think of as representatives of the extension classes between those elementary sheaves. So these quiver representations kind of tell us how to build up more general sheaves in our moduli space as some space, some kind of iterated extensions of these elementary objects. And in that sense, it's natural to try to think about these moduli spaces of coherent sheaves we'll be interested in as some spaces of iterated extensions of certain elementary objects. And that's gonna be an important uh, idea for the kind of general results that I'll state in the next lecture about the kind of uh, more general moduli spaces that we constructed for three folds that kind of generalize these. But I don't wanna to get too far ahead of myself. Um, are there any questions about this example before I go on? This is the end of the discussion about kind of the geometric section for now. So uh, you have asked about the cohomology. So the idea here, uh, I try to understand the, the zeroth cohomology that's in the middle, or is that the... Yeah, the, yeah. the monad construction, it's sort of a, very classical. It's a monad, the, the missing summand, it's the structure sheet, a tensor with C, not with V. So then just a monadic construction of either of a vector bundle or something, it's kind of an old way to speak about the generator in some derived categories. And so so the, the zeroth cohomology that should be the ideal shift that, I mean, in this case, it's the ideal of the full polynomial ring the OC2. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, Mm -hmm. So, for example, what you can see from the structure of the differentials is that uh, nothing maps to this bottom sum end, this structure sheaf of C2. Mm -hmm. And so it will, uh, whatever the kernel of the map leaving it is, that will be the, the kind of contribution to the cohomology of this sum end, that mm -hmm. nothing will get killed. Mm -hmm. And what is that map? It's precisely this map I that we were discussing, which is kind of, it's this algebraic incarnation of the map from the structure sheaf of C2 to this compactly supported coherent sheaf, which is like the structure sheaf of our sub scheme. And so, so the kernel of that basically map- that as, as a module that's set into a generator of that. Uh, I mean, in um, the the image would be the generator of the... Exactly. Of the model, right? Yeah, exactly. This is yeah. kind of... That's right. But I mean, now that it's it's thickened up to not just a vector space, but a, a kind of, you know, a, a free module. It's a module. Then, yeah. So the kernel of that map will really just be the ideal of mm -hmm. the zero-dimensional subscheme, which are the, the things... The upper part of that's the Kudu complex tensoring with V which remains to be exact, but deformed a little bit. Am I right? Yeah, so that's right. So, I mean, the Kuzul complex on its own would in principle have had cohomology in degree uh, plus one here, mm -hmm. given by the structure sheaf of this, this kind of uh, compactly supported uh, coherent sheaf, sorry, the structure sheaf of the zero dimensional sub scheme, or abstractly, maybe this compactly supported coherent sheaf, but it has a surjection, of course, from the structure sheaf of C2. That's what the map I here is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that also gets killed in the cohomology of this sort of full mm -hmm. complex. So the only thing you, the only non-trivial uh, cohomology is in H0. I could have written the entire cohomology here, whatever. Um, and it's, it's indeed this ideal sheaf as claimed. Okay, I see.
Thank you. And the producer a little bit questions. more on this uh, rep n f theta. So it's just a subset, which in general is a sub stack, but you mentioned that uh, this sub stack actually is a sub of a, it's a variety. Yeah, that's right. So it's maybe okay. not too hard to check. Yeah, so this, mm -hmm. this theta means sort of stable with respect to some stability condition, which I mean, I. So this will be I, similar to the, the Nakajima's stability condition. Yeah, it's, it's a special case of that, absolutely. Okay. Um, but in this particular case, you can actually spell out the algebraic condition to be stable more explicitly, and it's precisely this generation condition that I explained. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. No worries. Thanks for the questions. It's great to, I, I would have, uh, it's awkward giving talks over Zoom if no one says anything. Just be like, <laughs> No, is this thing on? Don't is worry, we are not sleeping. We are picking up every word. You say. <laughs> Great. The, the number of participants only in, is increasing with the time of your talk. So. Ah, excellent. Oh, yeah. Wow. Great. Um, okay, so let's continue. So the next thing I want to talk about is representation theory. And I'll maybe be a bit briefer now. Um, so the main kind of characters in the representation theory side of the correspondence I'm going to explain in the later lectures are called vertex algebras. And vertex algebras have a sort of unwieldy definition that I'll state part of below. But I think the most important thing to know is that a vertex algebra is it's some kind of algebraic object, I'll give the definition as I said, which encodes the data of a topological associative algebra in so-called purely algebraic terms. So if you have a topological associative algebra and you want to study things that have to do with its topology, but maybe you don't want to keep you know, thinking back to your analysis classes, it's possible if the topology is sort of sufficiently structured that you could encode various topological conditions in terms of some kind of explicit intricate algebraic conditions. And that's the nature of whatever text algebra is doing. So to say a bit about the motivation, let me recall the definition of the uh, affine Katsumudi central extension. So if you have any kind of reasonable finite dimensional, maybe you want it to be simple or whatever, uh, some kind of reasonable Lie algebra, that's our BRAC G here, you can of course consider the Lie algebra given by tensoring it with Laurent series or formal Laurent series in a variable Z. And there's a natural central extension of that Lie algebra, which I denote by G hat here, which is determined by the, the following uh, co-cycle, which is given by taking the two uh, sort of G-valued Laurent series, taking the formal Durand differential in Z of one of them, and then using some pairing on the Lie algebra. So again, maybe you need some kind of assumption that you have some non-degenerate pairing, but you use some pairing here. And then you take the residue at Z equals zero. This turns out to be some well-defined coordinate independent thing. Um, and it's some very uh, natural thing to study out. There's been a lot of interest in representation theory and these kinds of Lie algebras. And there's a natural topology on the enveloping algebra of such a Lie algebra, uh, defined by a basis in the sense of topology at the origin, given by the subspaces of the enveloping algebra, where the, you know, if you think of them as some kind of formal product of elements in the Lie algebra, you can ask that the total Z order, so the sum of the orders of the polynomials in Z of all the terms in the product is bounded by some integer. What this is kappa is... in your notation? Pardon me, what is kappa? Okay, I don't know. It depends on your text style. Yeah, it's a, it's a kappa. Yeah, that's right. Right, so when you consider the enveloping algebra of a centrally extended Lie algebra, it's often natural to pass to a quotient where you set the central parameter equal to the kind of one in the enveloping algebra. It's kind of some specialization of the, of the center. And so here I've, I've picked some specialization. So that's determined by setting this C equal to kappa times one in the enveloping algebra. I'll give an explicit example. Kappa is a level, am I right? Yeah, exactly. You could call okay. it level if you, that's right. Um, of course, there's also some kind of overall scalar contained in this pairing. 
and there's some kind of convention choice about how you absorb the scalar and the kind of definition of this central quotient versus in the pairing itself. But I don't, I don't really want to dwell on that. In any event, when one studies modules over affine Lie algebras, it's very common to study modules which are smooth with respect to this topology. If you open some paper of Kajdan-Lustig or something, studying some kind of variant of category O for affine Lie algebras, the kind of very first thing they'll assume about the modules that they're studying is that they satisfy some kind of compatibility with this topology. And these kinds of smooth modules are equivalent to what are called modules over this algebraic object called a vertex algebra. And so again, we'll think of this vertex algebra as kind of encoding this topology in some practical way. Whose theorem is it? Of course, it's a I mean, theorem. I, if you, if yeah. you dependent definition, so that's, yeah. Who, I, uh, I would say like Balenson and Drinfeld, personally. So there's a section in their book that describes this, which I think um, is uh, so it's, quite well is, written. Is it, is it true in, in some global version as well? Because he, 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 you here, should always. This is kind of more of a local invariant, um, but they, they study it sort of at any point on the curve. Uh, oh, okay. It's possible that it goes back beyond them, but I was actually going to say there's a very nice paper of Balenson that followed the book, which explains some things about kind of different, to, uh, different tensor structures on topological vector spaces and how they kind of arise naturally in geometric contexts. And I think that that is really like the most clear-headed source. But you know, if I was speaking in front of real vertex algebra people, maybe they would get mad and say, oh no, this was known by some, you know, vertex algebra founders. Um, I kind of think though that some of these details people I might not have seen. Um, so the uh, G hat and also the the uh, the loop algebra G uh, with a formal Laurent series Z. So this has also a natural topology. That's right. So because uh, at the zero, you have this the neighborhood. Yeah, this kind of compact. The compact maximum ideal, ideal, the eddic topology. And, uh, and that pass to the G-hat as a topological space. So therefore, on the quotient of the universal enveloping algebra, the topology passes to. So that's what uh, you, you meant. Yeah, it's the not subspace. a question about the topology, which is obvious. It's a question mm -hmm. about the result that you can forget about vertex algebra modules and, and study just topological modules or some associative algebra, which is a completion. Some yeah, this, uh, uh, well, in, in, in this case, uh, Franco and the two in, in the early 90s uh, did this for the universal enveloping algebra. Mm -hmm. Just... Um, okay. Okay. So the I mean the for the vertex algebra, this topology is automatically encoded inside of the definition. So, uh, at, for every point that you have a low, anyway, low the equivalent of categories, it kind of goes back to nineties. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and the, the yeah, I, I, think... Lustig, Lustig also didn't mention the word vertex algebra when they were defining the tensor product. But they were they using this version. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, oh. right. So I was going to briefly pay some lip service to the definition of a vertex algebra, but as I said before, it's not the most enlightening thing. But essentially, it's you take some vector space, which is a module over uh, some kind of canonical module over an algebra like this, and then you give the linear map, which maps from the vector space to the endomorphisms of that vector space adjoins sort of z to the plus minus one. And then it has some kind of unit vector and this map satisfies some kind of algebra-like properties. Again, I don't want to really dwell on it, but I'll give a concrete example on the next slide. And then similarly, a vertex algebra module is some kind of map from v to endomorphisms of m. Uh, again, uh, formal power series and z and z inverse. And then the to sort of just formally state the thing I said before, there's some kind of functor or assignment that takes a vertex algebra and gives you some 
topological associate of algebra, which I'll denote by curly U of B. I'll call it the algebra of modes, although I'm not sure if that terminology is standard and I don't really uh, want to spend time talking about that. But in any event, there's an equivalence of categories between the category of modules over this vertex algebra in the sense that I very loosely defined above and the category of smooth modules over this topological associate of algebra, U of V. Okay. So I just wanted to give a quick concrete example. So Heisenberg algebras and Fock modules. So the Heisenberg algebra is the uh, enveloping algebra of GL1 hat, again, with this uh, specialization. And I, in the following, I'm going to be a bit vague about completions. Again, there is some topology in the background, and we're going to complete at the end of the day. But just to get a sense of what's happening at the level of um, kind of generators. So this is some kind of tensor product, uh, you know, as by PBW, as all, or maybe just by definition, as all uh, enveloping algebras are, uh, generated by the formal Laurent series. And so if we write our formal Laurent series F as some kind of sum of BNs, then we can instead think that it's an algebra generated by kind of uh, an integers many generators B sub N. And the commutation relations that they'll satisfy will be that BM and BN commute unless M equals minus N or M plus N equals zero, in which case their commutator will be kappa, which is this number we fixed times N times the identity. So just like, you'll, you'll just get one in the, the center there. And I wanted to point out that this algebra, it's also, I think, kind of a good heuristic to think of it as differential operators on infinite dimensional affine space. So if you think of all of the negative BNs as mapping to some formal variables, Z sub N, it's minus N because N is negative for this case, or to derivatives with respect to those variables in the case that N is positive, and this gives a, a kind of feeling for where this, this commutation relation comes from. And it's, it's a familiar thing, kind of like in finite dimensional Heisenberg algebras. I guess and you, these, you, you, you need the kappa to be non-zero to have this differential operator. Sure, that's right. Yeah. If kappa and, is zero, so it's, it's commutative. Yeah, it'll be commutative. That's right. Um, so there's also a natural, uh, a natural module for these, which is just, you can look at the induced module where you let the uh, all of the positive part of the formal Laurent series, the formal power series, act by zero on one dimensional vector space. And you let the central extension term act by kappa on this one dimensional vector space, C kappa. And this induced module, it will just simply be isomorphic to the polynomial algebra in the BNs for n negative. And this just looks, again, like functions on infinite dimensional affine space by the correspondence I explained above. And the module structure will be like differential operators acting on functions. Um, now, we can formally write down this map that I was describing before that sends this module, pi kappa, to endomorphisms of itself. So for any element of pi kappa, I can write down this kind of formal infinite sum of these endomorphisms, bn these generators. And then there's some kind of indexing shift that happens with this derivative and this you know, dividing by k factorial. But the main point is just that this map evidently encodes all of the data of this representation, because all of the endomorphisms induced by the generators are all appearing here. And moreover, this, this representation is in some sense faithful. And maybe you might worry, like, if you have a big topological associative algebra, that it might be, you know, maybe you want to be a bit careful about exactly what you mean by it having a faithful representation. But this notion of vertex algebra is kind of capturing that in a nice way. It's saying that you can just take this module itself, together with some data about the way that this algebra acts on it, which is encoded in, you know, some kind of endomorphisms of the given module. And from this data, you're going to be able to recover your original associative algebra. And so this is some kind of nice presentation. And I just want to point out that there's some more general family of algebras, or of modules, pardon me, uh, which are defined by the same kind of induced module construction, but where you pick a co-weight of 
you know, in general, you could have a more than one dimensional abelian Lie algebra with a pairing. It doesn't need to just be GL1 with the kind of trivial pairing. And you can induce up something where the kind of zeroth copy of H inside of Laurent or inside of the formal power series acts by lambda with class by kappa, and you build this kind of more interesting module. And for a general abelian Lie algebra with pairing, there'll be an analogous vertex algebra, which is just some kind of higher dimensional version of this uh, Heisenberg algebra I defined above. And for any weight lambda, you'll obtain a, uh, or maybe it's a weight the way I've written it, sorry about that. Um, you'll obtain a, uh, a module over this, this kind of Heisenberg algebra for H. So this is kind of the basic, uh, the basic algebraic setting. And now I'm a bit short on time, so I'm going to kind of uh, rush through the next couple slides. I should be OK. I'll finish up at 30 sharp. Um, so the next, so that was just a brief overview of the algebraic objects that are in the game. There are these kind of infinite dimensional algebras related to uh, affine Lie algebras, things like their enveloping algebras. And now I want to explain how geometry is related to representations of such algebras. And I'm going to use a very classical paradigm in geometric representation theory, which are called convolution algebras. So convolution algebras are associative algebras which have constructions, sort of geometric constructions, which generalize the notion of convolution of integral kernels, which you might remember from like calculus or functional analysis or something. It's some classical thing where if you have like functions of two variables, a pair of them, you can kind of integrate out the middle variable and get some new function of two variables. And this defines some kind of algebra structure. It's a very kind of classical thing. Um, and there's also a natural way to construct representations of such things. And this is maybe the more familiar thing that's called convolution. If you have a function f and another function d, g, you can write like f of x minus y, g of y, and integrate with respect to x and you'll or with respect to y and you'll get some new function of x and this gives you a map from kind of g of y to some new function f convolved with the g of x i know i said that in words and it was kind of fast but again this is some very kind of undergrad level analysis stuff and this is a kind of homological version of that so the setting is the following if we take f from x to y with x smooth f proper and z the fiber product of x with itself over y, then we can consider the Borel-Moore homology groups. These should really be shifted, but I'm going to ignore the cohomological shift. And the statement is that these homology groups will be algebras over the base field k with respect to this kind of convolution operation that I was describing. And if you're a very um, modern-minded person, one kind of slick way of seeing this algebra structure is to note that these homology groups are the same as the space of endomorphisms of the push forward of the constant sheaf of X inside of the category of sheaves on Y by some kind of simple base you, change argument. You talk what? Vector spaces, abelian groups? Sorry, what was the question? Sheaves, sheaves on Y, what kind of sheaves? Really? Yeah, something like, like a, yeah, vector spaces or abelian groups. Maybe, I mean, maybe like constructible sheaves. Probably in that space is <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of a D modules person, but this should work in kind of any any formalism. But here, yeah, you can definitely use sheaves of vector spaces, and that'll be fine. But maybe everything should be derived to get this statement that I'm claiming here. To be clear. Um, this is just a heuristic, though. I'm not going to rely on it too much. But what I wanted to point out is there's a more concrete way of seeing this algebra structure, which is more the flavor of the thing I said in words, this kind of convolution of integral kernels, which is that there's this natural correspondence between three copies of the self-fiber product given by the kind of triple self-fiber product. So this space has three projections to Z, projection to the first two factors, the second two factors, or the first and third factor. And if you pull back along the first two projections, and then push forward along the second, that defines a kind of multiplication map from A tensor squared to A. Again, you need to be careful about the kind of conditions about smoothness and properness I mentioned in order to get all the relevant maps working. But the claim is you get a, a map like this and it defines an associative algebra structure for sort of obvious reasons. 
And similarly, if you have another space mapping to y and you form the fiber product of it with x, <clears throat> which again can be identified with uh, some homomorphism of sheaves as denoted, this will be a module uh, over this algebra, or there will be a representation of this algebra on this other vector space. And again, you can give a geometric construction very similar to the one I wrote here. So let me just quickly outline some examples of this. So if we have uh, a bunch of points mapping to a point, it's not hard to see that this gives GLN. And if we take W to also be a point, then you'll get its action just on matrices. So this can recover some very, very classical things in the simplest examples. If we take Y still to be a point, but X to be a more interesting space, then we get the algebra being some kind of borel moore homology of x times x, inside of which we can study the theory of classical integral kernels by taking a function and multiplying it by the fundamental class of the diagonal. And finally, just for culture, maybe this is out of the screen now, I'll just mention that taking x to be the cotangent bundle of the flag variety and y to be the nil cone, uh, this naturally leads to what people call Springer theory. And you can learn about all this stuff in the book of Chris and Ginsburg. It's kind of a classic graduate textbook in geometric representation theory. So now just in the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna unfortunately sort of breeze through this final slide, um, which is the main application in the simplest example. So if we let, let, let S be a smooth projective service and hill ben of S the Hilbert scheme as we discussed above, there's a classical theorem of Gauche, which calculated this generating function of the type I introduced in the beginning of the lecture. Um, and you know it has a seemingly kind of complicated formula, but it was actually discovered independently by Gronowski and Nakajima that there's a natural algebraic refinement of this given by these kind of geometric representation theory methods. So they introduced some correspondences defined for each homology class in the surface S itself, correspondences between the Hilbert schemes for different numbers of points. And by pulling back and pushing forward along such correspondences, by the types of things that I was just explaining on the last slide, there's some natural endomorphisms or sort of maps between these vector spaces, again, for different ends. And if we sum them up over all possible ends, this will give us some endomorphisms of this vector space, which I've kind of suggestively denoted pi sub s, the direct sum of all of the homology groups, which I just want to note the kind of graded Euler characteristic of this thing is precisely the uh, the object which is being calculated on the left-hand side of this kind of impressive formula of Gauche. And now the theorem that was proved by Gronowski and Nakajima is that this geometric construction defines a representation of the algebra of modes of the Heisenberg algebra, where the Heisenberg algebra is that which is built out of the abelian Lie algebra defined by taking the homology of S and then giving it the pairing, the intersection pairing. And moreover, uh, under this map, th this tells you that pi sub s is some kind of module over what I call pi of s, this Heisenberg algebra, the vertex algebra, uh, in the sense I defined above. And it's precisely just the usual vacuum module, the kind of Fock module we described. And it's, it's not a hard exercise. Maybe it would be a fun thing to check if you're a grad student or something to see that this you can use the description I explained above to compute the kind of graded Euler characteristic of this vector space, or the, what people in vertex algebra is called the character of this vector space, and find that you get the right-hand side of this formula here. So understanding this algebraic structure, I just want to point out this is kind of the simplest example where it's really good for something, because it gives you this uh, nice closed form expression that was determined by Gauche. And uh, it's exactly 30. So I uh, better stop there. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I I I I I heard in the conferences and it's uh, uh, written differently and spelled differently. Gotcha. He is German. I, I believe there should be two dots. Over there should four. be two dots. Yeah, here. It's well, like Schrodin. It's like similar. Yeah. So, yeah. I have to go. I have a class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, for, the, for those who do not have uh, run, uh, are there any questions? Uh, uh, in the chat, Alina posted slides which have 
two more very interesting pages which you can study before the next lecture which will be on wednesday not tomorrow but on wednesday same time right uh, let me just say uh sorry for going a bit fast and at the end but also the last two slides were uh optional i sort of knew that we might not get to them so don't feel like obliged to read them or anything uh this thing that i rushed to here was as far as i sort of strictly wanted to get uh okay uh, are there any questions maybe from guests because i see some familiar yeah. names uh, okay well if there are no questions then let's thank dylan for a very nice uh, lecture uh, and uh, see you on wednesday